Oh. It hurt because it was true. It hurt because he was right. I'm useless. Twindle remained silent, but clasped her hand on Lance's shoulder, waiting patiently for her to go on. I've always been good at my job, scaring off ruffians, reporting disturbances in the Fallwood. But when it comes to important events, I fade into obscurity. There's been nothing great I have accomplished. I'm the second best living watcher from the Fallwood. And yet, I feel as if I've done nothing to change. Her voice caught to really change anything. She finished wiping tears away with her palm, the links of her chains clattering against one another with the motion. I'm insignificant. Fire Eyes knows it, and Hoplite does too. They have both laid it out plainly for me. I can't change anything. Twindle remained silent for another moment, waiting for Lance to continue. When she did not, Twindle said gently, that isn't true. She shook her head. You're just trying to make me feel better. That's all right, but I can handle the truth. I couldn't make a dent in that horde earlier, not even hold my own like the rest of you. I'm a... a liability. Hoplite's just blunt enough to admit the truth when you're too nice. A sniff punctuated her breath as she lifted up her arms. I bet these chains felt sorry for me, too. It's like Hoplite all over again, but nestled against my arms, weighing me down and reminding me that I can't do anything compared to everyone else without outside magic. Twindo forced a sigh down. She'd seen many a worshipper demean themselves for not being as tranquil as possible for Athena's sake feeling worthless and unworthy of the fate. Hells, she'd felt that way more than once. She kept her tone gentle and comforting. Not everyone in this party is meant to be a combat specialist, but I should be, at least to stop from getting cursed. That's not my point, the paladin interjected, pausing on how to address the much older elf, sweetheart. It's that your skills don't have to be only focused and valued by how many fiends, by how many fiends, you can incapacitate. Lance only shook her dark hair. If killing was the only metric we used, then healers would be just as much a liability as you think you are. No one would bother building Fiction's house, and battle tactics would be measured in individuals cutting swaths through enemies. Does that sound like our world? The elf heaved a sigh and narrowed her reddened eyes. I am no child, Twindle. She bit her lip, realizing her mistake. Sorry, what I mean to say is that you have plenty of skills that the rest of us haven't had the opportunity to cultivate. You're a watcher of the beautiful Fowood. I bet you know so much more about nature and tracking than anyone, and you've had the years to specialize and branch out into aspects of watcherhood that have made you stand out in your group, right? That doesn't change that every encounter we have from here on is a death sentence for me if I dare step out to help. Lance replied, at least not until I learn how to use these chains. Then find a way to help from behind the front lines. Twindle offered. To be honest, I think you're being too hard on yourself. Our party has some advantages in combat that most don't. Like what? Lance looked up. The paladin cursed a near slip. We've been traveling across our coolest for some time, fighting off powerful foes. In fact, she paused to give her next words more weight. Kazon himself, has been goading us into becoming strong enough to fight him. What? Why? Twindle raised her shoulders. We aren't sure why exactly us in particular, she said vaguely. But he's taken something very precious from all of us. We've had no choice but to become as strong and battle-hardened as quickly as possible to save what we love. 
if it's not too late, that is. Lance examined her closely. Twindle felt the weight and potential wisdom hiding in the older elf's eyes and backpedaled from the top. This isn't about me and my party's woes. We've had to bond together out of necessity and your situation is probably different. The point is that what you've trained for isn't the place you find yourself. You couldn't possibly have prepared for these drawbacks in close combat. But I think you've got what it takes to adapt and find a place in this group, as hard-headed as it is. She attempted a small grin and chuckled to soothe the Watcher. I doubt that Hoplite would have let just anyone follow him around on such a cursed adventure. Even if he didn't say it outright, the fact that he didn't insist on you staying home means that he's seen you hold your own and wants your help, right? Lance tilted her head back and forth with a shrug. She was distracted with the topic of Hoplite effectively. Shutting down any further questions about Twindo or the rest's past. She was sure the topic of Kazan's interest in them would come up once more. But that was something that could be talked about another time. Twindo did not wish to speak of it now. Trust me, you're not useless to the party. We can find ways to make you stand out more. But it might not be in the way you're used to. Think about it, and we can all work together. All right, Lancelot. The dark-haired elf fiddled with the chains around her arms again, quiet and solemn. After a few moments, she said, All right, I'll think about it. Though with these, she continued, lifting her chained arms, I might be able to remain in my comfort zone, at least when it comes to battle. That's good to hear. The paladin smiled. If you want to give that chunk of metal a good talking to, you'll have everyone's support. Well, perhaps she'd not have Michael's support, or Nalvi's, or Alistair's, or Twindle blinked. They didn't seem the type to get too involved with personal drama. But Lance would at least have her support. She breathed out an amused sound. Nah. I'm too run down right now. I'll talk to him tomorrow, maybe. When we've both had a chance to calm ourselves. Wise. Twindle replied with a nod. All right, now we should be figuring out how these chains of yours work, unless you aren't up to it. Lance smiled. Of course I am. I don't need to sleep tonight, so I'll have plenty of time to learn. I might be able to help too, I'm not a full-blooded elf, but I feel that I'm able to stay up until midnight at least. She said, again nodding, I've spoken with plenty of people who've performed the bonding, and they've explained to me how they get their items to function. I appreciate it, truly, but... Lance paused, I was wondering if you could perhaps check on Hoplite, see if you can't get him to come inside. It's about time for him to sleep, I think. Twindle smiled. Certainly. I'm sure that he will have calmed down by now. I'm surprised that you would worry over him after what just happened. Lance shrugged. Just because we had a little spat doesn't mean he shouldn't get sleep. I'd go out there and tell him to do it myself, but... But I still want some time on my own. I understand. Twindle said with a nod. I'm off. If you decide you want help with your chains, just let me know. With that, Twindle turned on her heel, walking back toward the entrance of the tunnel. She passed the rest of the party, including Michael, on the way back. Alistair and he seemed to be leading the talk, each asking about one another's methods during the battle. Their tones seemed awed and complimentary, and this pleased her. Those two may become good friends if they maintain decent rapport. At least she thought so. As she passed them, the Outworlder made a comment about Hoplite needing more time to himself. But Twindle felt that he had likely cooled off already. He didn't seem the type to remain angry for long periods of time. 
Twindle did tell Michael that she would return if Hoplite was still upset, and this seemed to satisfy him, for he drifted back into conversation with ease. She rounded the corner, taking a deep breath to steal her nerves. How did she bring tranquility to a man who didn't think he was one? If what Lance said was accurate, then he only viewed himself the same way as she viewed a bucket or a wrench. Could she convince him that he wasn't the tool he thought he was? It sounded as if some intensive indoctrination had taken place when he was a child. Chipping away at such a worldview would be much like mining a mountain with a toothpick. Hoplite saw his existence through a very thick lens, a lens that never bent nor smudged, at least not without outside help. She knew it to be so, for she understood exactly what it was like to see things through that very same lens. She'd not try and break that lens today. It was far too soon, and this was an inappropriate time. Twindo would just do what Lance had asked of her, and bring the man inside for rest. Now that she thought of it, it had been a few days since he had last slept. She rounded the corner. It was absolutely unhealthy to Twindle gasped in shock as standing there. Next to Hoplite was a towering, silvery man, clad in the most ornatory man, clad in the most ornate plate mail she had ever seen. He towered over the outworlder by at least two heads, with snow-white hair as long as she was tall, draping down over his long, silvery cape. Who was this man, and why was he talking with Hoplite? So, that is your answer? The man asked, his angelic voice reaching her ears just barely. Leave Artois. She heard Hoplite order in a sharp tone. You won't speak of my lord that way. If you stay, I will be forced to neutralize you. The stranger laughed then, a hearty, amused sound that echoed across the bridge. If you deny such a lineage, then you will show me proof. Remove your helmet for me. The man ordered in a tone that expected compliance. I have no more time for this boy. Surprisingly, Hoplite's hands reached up toward his helmet. But as they were just about to remove them, they froze. The outworlder's hands began shaking before they lowered, almost as if they were being forced back down. The stranger then gave an irritated sound. That is almost proof enough for me as it is. But this still does not satisfy me. I command thee kneel. Kneel. And Hoplite fell to his knees. Chapter 16. Latest Chapter. The dragon of the East Hoplite's face remained blank as his mind toiled to understand what he had done to upset Lance. Any living thing with a frontal lobe would have been able to see that she would have been a liability to him had she stayed. His focus would have been split between protecting her and defeating Talak, and he wasn't sure that he would have been able to keep her safe amongst the Horde. There had been so many fiends, an army of bodies that would have crushed her flat had he not told her the reality of the situation. Twindle had mentioned that he could have worded it more nicely, but there simply hadn't been enough time for that. Could he have said it would be safer for everybody if they went into the tunnel together, rather than singling out Lance and Michael? His mentality at the time had been to let Twindle's party do as they wished. Their magic would have aided in controlling the crowds. It was risky, of course, but they had proven capable of repelling such odds before. Alistair's golden flame, Elum's acid, Nalvi's eyes, not to mention Twindle and Kidka's nice superhuman capabilities, would have proved useful, but not Lance or even Michael, in that particular scenario. All the ammunition had been back on the wagon and the Marine would have quickly ran out of the ammo on his person. He had been instrumental in repelling the fiends once he'd actually returned to the wagon and had access to the munitions stored there, but out in the open he would have been infected for sure. Still, 
he would have managed to hold his own outside the tunnel. At least for a while before having to retreat. But Lance... She was an excellent warrior, but she wouldn't have been able to last had she gotten separated in the chaos. He hadn't wanted her to die or become infected, so he had told her the truth, and somehow, that hurt her. Badly, Hoplite was completely in the right. His understanding of what would have happened was based on a dozen lifetimes worth of combat experience. He knew that blood was red, he knew that grass was green. He knew that she'd have died had he not sent her away. And yet, he still felt like he was wrong somehow. It frustrated him to no end. Just a short while ago, he'd not have given this subject any thought he'd just move on. Something has changed. He was not acting normally. He knew he wasn't. He hadn't been behaving right since he decided to imbibe alcohol at that celebration. Maybe even before that. Yet, as he thought on this, his thoughts turned back to Theopalo. Whatever his condition... Somehow Hoplite knew that his thawing was being accelerated by the Elder Elf's presence. He hated that wretched creature with every fiber of his being. And still, he knew not why. Was it his uncaring, laid-back attitude? No. That couldn't be it. Hoplite had met several soldiers with similar disposition, and he'd only been annoyed by them then. This was a hatred that threatened to scorch him from the inside out every time he laid eyes on that damn elf. Could he convince the others to leave Theopalo behind? Maybe send him back to the Fallwood for the rest of this trip? He was a liability. All he did was eat and sleep, and his caloric intake was far greater than anyone else's. Even Hoplite himself didn't eat as much as Theopalo did. If they kept him on like this, He'd devour all their supplies before they could accomplish their respective goals. His apparent uses were not worth starving to death or becoming infected. Yet, what if they refused to send him away? What if they insisted upon keeping that idler around until he sucked up every scrap of food they had? His face then became grim, his fists clenching as he looked away from the sky instead staring at the mouth of the tunnel where that freak resided. He hadn't even helped with the fighting, he just slept in the wagon like a useless sack of knife-eared dung. He didn't really need to ask for the squad's consent, right? Surely they would understand why Theopalo needed to be neutralized, right? Hoplite could simply opt to not inform them of the deed. It would cause fissures that may lead to separation or conflict. As for Theopalu, all it would take was a quick squeeze, and the bastard's neck would snap. After that, he could dispose of the corpse by tossing it over the side of the bridge. No one would be able to find the body, leaving the others to speculate that he'd abandoned them. Yes, it was all coming together now. Hoplite blinked, his head shaking slightly as he came to his senses. Had he just plotted a murder? It wasn't as if he hadn't killed anyone before. At the order of the Eighth Arm, he had been set upon humanity's enemies within. Though it had been rare for them to call on Thirty-Seven for that task. Even then, he had never planned out the deed himself. The orders on who to kill, and how to do it, were always passed down to him by command as assassination wasn't his field of expertise. Hoplite 21 had been suited to that task. He was a precise killer. A sharp blade used to slice throats in the dark, but 37? He was a hammer, sent in with heavy gear to smash the enemy's lines to pieces. If he were to carry out his plot to kill Theopalu, he'd likely be exposed somehow. He felt a pit forming in his stomach, as he thought about how Lance would react. She seemed to care for Theopalu, though he knew not why. They had presumably worked together for centuries, he supposed that some sort of rapport would have formed during that time. If Hoplite took that geriatric elf away from her, she'd be devastated. The pit, 
in his gut grew as he imagined her grief. And again he found himself shaking his head to clear away the images flashing in his mind, to wash away the imaginings of tearful accusations and demands to know why. The images were so vivid, so real that he found himself readying an explanation, though there were none to hear it had he done so. This was ridiculous. Theopala was not dead, and these scenarios playing out in his head were pointless. Despite that they seemed to widen that pit in his gut, and he found himself almost retching at the sudden nausea he felt. He felt, oh, so very wrong. Had he been infected after all? Was he becoming a fiend? No, that was impossible. He'd not been injured during the fighting whatsoever, and it had been several minutes since the battle had ended. He couldn't be infected, meaning that what he felt now, opening a hole in his midsection, was guilt. It felt horrible. Before he could reason himself back into feeling normal, a form materialized behind him. Hoplite gasped, turning with wide eyes at the towering being. Wearing silvery plate armor, with long white hair that blended in with the cape worn about his neck, stood Lord Jin. His mouth struggled for a brief instant before he caught himself. This was not his lord. This was someone or something else. This look-alike had the same stone-carved stern features, the same golden eyes, the same nigh-overwhelming presence. But his hair was wrong. White instead of red, long instead of short. There were no scars on this stranger's face, whereas Lord Jin had accrued several. His armor, while just as ornate, was primitive compared to Lord Jin's power arm. The two shared a passing resemblance, nothing more. How had he snuck up on Hoplite? The man had been invisible, but Hoplite's motion tracker should have been able to detect him approaching. Perhaps he hadn't approached. Maybe he had teleported, as Hoplite himself once had when he'd first met the Harkhaw. He drew the fortis, aiming it squarely at the interloper's head. Identify. Hoplite demanded sharply, finger lightly brushing the trigger. Put your weapon down, the silvery figure commanded, his voice almost a whisper. Hoplite's hand shook at the order, seeming to try and comply against his will. His teeth clenched, keeping the gun raised through sheer effort. It was as if a hand of iron had clutched his wrist, threatening to pin it down by his side should he relent for even an instant. It took everything he had to merely disobey the stranger's command. Now, the stranger yelled, forcing Hoplite's wrist to finally buckle. Hoplite stared with his jaw agape as his hand worked against his will. Magnetizing the fortis to his thigh despite his efforts to resist. What kind of magic was this that could force him to another's will? He fought it again, trying to reach for the fortis with struggling fingers. It was like a thousand pounds of weight had been tied to each of his fingers, getting them to budge seemed nigh impossible. I am Legolanthus, the dragon of the East. He said, his deep cadence lending weight to the title. And apologies, young man. I did not wish it to come to this, but I simply must know of your lineage. Simply observing you has not given me the evidence I desire. Who is your father? The question nearly caused Hoplite to force out an answer, but he kept his jaw clenched and mouth sealed. His hands shook with the effort but he held fast. The Dragon of the East. He had heard of this man at Muro's Death Day celebration. Apparently, the recently deceased Watcher had survived meeting with him, having been subjected to the Dragon's will, 
Hoplite now understood why this feat was considered impressive. He'd always thought it was because Legolanthus was supposed to be a classic dragon of legend, a giant fire-breathing lizard that hoarded treasure. Yet now that that very same dragon was here, Hoplite could see that it was more a title than anything else. While massive, Legolanthus appeared to be human, at least on the surface. His biology clearly differed from standard human genetics. Was his massive stature the result of magical gene tampering? Or was he a member of a species that merely resembled humans? Legolanthus seemed amused at his resistance for a brief instant, before his familiar features hardened your father. Who is he? The dragon ordered his intense golden gaze boring into Hoplite's helmet. I don't know, Hoplite replied honestly, hoping his answer pleased the dragon. He cursed himself at the emotion. How dare he desire to please this creature? Legolanthus needed to be put down quickly. His fist snapped forth at a blinding speed intending to catch the hostile in the nose. Instead, his fist was battered away with an almost lazy hand, the clang of adium on steel echoing across the bridge. Hoplite reeled from the shock, both from the force that had traveled up his shoulder and the fact that he'd been deflected. Do not dare to try and lay hand on me again, Legolanthus warned, his tone dripping with menace. If you do not know your father, then I will ask this. Who reigns over Earth? Earth? He knew the name of the homeworld. Who reigns? Legolanthus asked again, more intensely. The Lord of Humanity and her colonies. Hoply told him, his voice shaking with rage, Lord Jin. Jin? Legolanthus asked, his brow furrowing. The dragon seemed perplexed by the name. Jin. Jin. He began muttering. That is not the name I thought he would go by, if this Jin is who I think he is. Hoply growled at how easily this creature disregarded his lord's title. Hot hatred bubbling up within him the more Legolanthus spoke. It wasn't the same type of hate he felt for Theopal. No, this was something different. The more he stared at this insufferable stranger, the more he wanted to be better than him. Hoplite desired to trump this dragon in every way, shape, and form, and would not be satisfied until Legolanthus knew his place. I believe that your lord... Legolanthus said with clear disdain, is one of my kind, an outcast banished from this realm to yours. Is this djinn a dragon? Hoplite's features twisted into that of a snarling beast at the mutant's accusation. His skin went cold, his teeth bared, fists clenched as he attempted to will himself forth to crush Legolanthus's wretched throat. How dare he accuse the pinnacle of man of being not of humanity? Hoplite Twenty-Five's claims flashed through his mind for a brief instant before he stowed them back away. He did not acknowledge those accusations. He would not. He could not, or he would be reindoctrinated. He would not, could not let that happen again. No, Lord Jin is a man. Hoplite shouted desperately, his voice unsteady. Legolanthus crossed his arms, not saying anything in response as Hoplite collected himself. A whirlwind of emotions raged through him. Rage, doubt, fear, all coalescing together and threatening to shatter his psyche with their intensity. He stilled his shuddering breaths summoning up his discipline to reign in the wild feelings. It felt as if he were trying to uproot the Ilum tree with his bare hands, but eventually the worthless emotions were subjugated to his will. Legolanthus stood, 
straight back and tone steeled. So, that is your answer? He asked, frowning. Leave. Hoplite ordered in a sharp tone. You won't speak of my lord that way. If you stay, I will be forced to neutralize you. The dragon laughed then, a hearty, amused sound that echoed across the great bridge. If you deny such a lineage, then you will show me proof. Remove your helmet for me. The man ordered in a tone that expected compliance. I have no more time for this boy. Hoplite's hands reached up toward his helmet, again yielding to Legolanthus. But as they were just about to remove his helmet, his will became steel. His hands began shaking again as he fought to lower them back to his sides, lowering them with an audible grunt. The dragon then gave an irritated sound. That is almost proof enough for me as it is. But this still does not satisfy me. I command thee kneel. And Hoplite fell to his knees, snarling as his body betrayed him. Legolanthus drew close, leaning down to stare into his soul. Remove your bunny helmet dot dot. He commanded again his eyes now glowing gold. Wispy tendrils of this glow emanated from not only the dragon's eyes, but his very mouth, the ethereal light, looking almost like fire. Hoplite relented, his eyes wide and face frozen in a snarl. He bumped his chin, undoing the clasp that kept the helmet sealed to the rest of the suit before removing it holding it at chest height as Legolanthus stared at him, glowing eyes searching. The eyes are gold, the creature muttered, yet that alone is not enough. Using his thumbnail, he carved a bleeding trail across Hoplite's cheek, the hot blood pouring down his skin and, and onto the dragon's hand. Legolanthus cursed quickly stepping back as the glow in his eyes vanished. Damn it all! It's true! Step away from him now! A voice shouted. Hoplite turned his head to see Twindle, standing there with blade drawn, charging toward Legolanthus with a fiery glare. The dragon turned his head to regard her, his face clearly expressing contempt. Wretched creature, be gone! Legolanthus shouted, raising his hand toward Twindlepalm first. Another glow then shone from his hand, a deep crimson orb of light that grew larger with each passing second. With the power of that gaze removed from him, Hoplite roared, quickly rising to his feet and dropping his helm. Legolanthus turned too late as Hoplite's fist met his chin, knocking it skyward with a sickening crunch. The glow in his hand faded, and Hoplite rammed his shoulder into his chest plate. Somehow, Legolanthus managed to remain standing, but was still sent sliding back across the stone, the sound of steel scraping rock loud in his ears. Legolanthus stood straight-backed once more, jaw hanging uselessly for only an instant before it reformed, a hand cradling his chin as his mouth worked. The damage had seemingly regenerated, but that was fine. If his healing factor worked like Hoplite's did, then all he needed to do was overwhelm it until the dragon became a husk. If he went into a state similar to that of going Wendigo, however, that may make this more difficult. Twindle's charge slowed as she neared, circling behind the dragon with her blade at the ready. He wanted to tell her to flee to tell her that this monster was too much for her to handle. But even more than that, Hoplite wanted to express his hate. I will crush your head, Dragonling, and wear it about my neck for your wretched father to see. Legolanthus shouted, eyes aglow once more. Hoplite's teeth clenched, his eyes going wide as the world began to take a crimson tint. Shut your dirty mutant mouth. He shouted, his voice ragged yet booming. I'll rip out your eyes and feed them to you. Just as he and Legolanthus were about to charge one another, however, 
a man materialized between them, causing Legolanthus to flinch back. This new stranger wore ratty brown clothing, with equally disheveled bushy brown hair that covered his head and face. Despite his entrance, he appeared to be a standard human. So why did Legolanthus stare at him like he was a viper? Come on now, the stranger said in a jovial tone. Family reunions are supposed to be heartwarming. Though, I do suppose they can turn ugly too, now that I think of it. His head then turned back toward the mouth of the rest stop then. A small knowing smile on his lips probably would be ugly. Now that I think of it, he muttered, seeming to zone out. Mind your business, Mazik. Legolanthus spat. This foul poopai has challenged me. This is now between dragons. You cannot interfere. Be gone. He didn't, though. Mazik said with a casual shrug. Technically, he just threatened you. He didn't challenge you. There is a difference. He struck me. The dragon growled. That alone is grounds enough for you forced your will on him, Mazik said sharply, cutting him off. I would say that was a fair reaction to what you did. Besides, it doesn't matter. I won't let you kill him here. You would stand in my way. The dragon asked, face becoming stone. Yes. Would you like to challenge me instead? Mazik asked, smiling gently. Legolanta said nothing, instead refocusing his gaze on Hoplite. We will meet again, Dragonly. If you know what is best, you will stay in the dirt with all the other worms that are beneath my notice. Hoplite said nothing, opting to simply glare into the mutant's eyes. There was a palpable tension there, something besides hatred now, something he had felt back when he began training as a Hoplite, rivalry. I now know what I had feared, Legolanthus said. The banished child has returned to wreak vengeance on the pillars. I must prepare. Without breaking eye contact, the dragon flourished his flowing white cape and disappeared from sight. Hoplite's head whipped this way and that, trying to catch a glimpse of where he could have went. He couldn't let Legolanthus ambush him. Where would he attack from behind above? He is gone now, Mazik said with a sigh honestly. What a bother, he's over two thousand still. He behaves like a two hundred year old. He chuckled, shaking his head. I am Mazik, and I'm afraid that I can't be staying for tea. I only intervene due to my brother's foolishness. He lacks subtlety in such matters, especially when he loses patience. Your brother? Hoplite asked. Are you a dragon too? No, Hoplite. Twindle said, her hands shaking as she held her blade. He is, she stuttered. He is the unbound, the god with no pillar. She finished, her voice becoming hoarse.